Thank you for joining us today. We are so glad you're tuning in. Text us using the number at the bottom of the screen to let us know you're watching, if you need prayer, or if you just want more information. You can also visit us online at truenorthak.org. Hello, everybody. Would you stand to your feet? Come on, put those hands together. Let's sing like the angels sang when they saw baby Jesus so long ago. Angels, we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains and the mountains in reply. Joy is strained. could be. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. Mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being loosed. God, we believe, and yes, we can see it, that wonders are still what you do. We are here. what you do. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. Set our hearts on you. Come and do what you do. Cause we need a move. Oh, we need a move. 
happen when you move Healing is coming in this room Miracles happen when you move Heaven is coming Oh, come on, sing it again Miracles happen when you move Healing is coming and leaders that would like to pray with you and if you would like that at this time we're going to sing this song again and I don't know what it is but I know he knows everything about you so would you like to come up here as we sing this again miracles happen when you move healing is coming in this room miracles happen when you move Healing is coming Oh, it's in this place Come on Miracles happen When you move Healing is coming In this room Miracles happen When you move Heaven is coming This is a move Oh, this is a move Your mighty spirit is in this place. Oh, this is a move. This is a move. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. So long ago, you came on a silent night. It even says a holy night. Your presence is in this place, and we honor the baby Jesus, but also the King Jesus.
devote ourselves to you, Jesus. Oh, come let us people saying our affection and our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus at this season I think of the wise men I think of the shepherds pouring their devotion their affection all the years they've been waiting for the Messiah to come right there at the feet of where you were at in your little cradle in your little manger with the animals and your mom and dad, Mary and Joseph. God, we do that today. We honor baby Jesus, but we also know that King Jesus is alive and well and living in this place, in our country, in our world, in our city, in our families, in our homes. We thank you, God, that your presence is here and we do honor, we give our affection, our devotion all to you today. In your mighty name we pray, amen. Come on, can you give the Lord a hand clap of prayer? Yes! Hi friends, my name is Mark and I'm one of the pastors here at True North Church. And I want to say thank you for joining us today for our broadcast. I hope that the worship just that was just on was a blessing to you. I hope the message speaks to your heart. Our, our prayer is that you're encouraged with this. And I want to encourage you, if you're watching and you consistently watch and you want to make sure this broadcast is online, would you consider giving toward it? Would you partner with us? We'd love for you to do that. True North Church is an irrationally generous church. We truly believe we're more blessed to give than receive. I hope you enjoy the message that's following. God bless you. Thanks for joining us. Wow. How many of you guys are having a good day so far? Man, did you guys look at the forecast? My latest forecast is going to be 31 degrees next week. That's a 75 degree shift, and we're still below freezing. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? This is literally the coolest place in the world to live. Incredible. My name is Mark, and I'm one of the pastors here. And, and uh, on the way out, please pick up some invites for Christmas Eve. Uh, they've already started rehearsals. Uh, you know, we, we have, we're going to have incredible, you know, singing some carols, things like that. Um, but, but there's a ton of special music, a ton of special singers, and some acting, and some cost. Well, I don't know if there's costumes. Um, some people need some costumes. Um, <laughs> That's, don't say that on Sunday, or don't, no. Actually, hey, uh, 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 we're in a series um, called uh, uh, Christmas Truce, and we're actually, in fact, this is, this is being live streamed, being recorded live stream, and, and for CBS, we give it up for those watching online right now, and, and uh, we're so glad that we have an opportunity to do that. In fact, uh, almost weekly now, we're meeting people who met us online or met us at CBS or uh, in, in one of the correctional facilities where we live stream and we, and, and we show, um, uh, you're pre, you know, we, we, we live stream the messages and God's doing great things. Um, tonight, or today, as we talk about the Christmas truths, and it's not the truth about Christmas, I, I think I've said that the last couple of weeks, but I want to look at the Christmas story, but I want to look at it in a new way today. I, 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 as I was studying for this, I was thinking about about, number one, some of us listening right now, Christmas is an incredible time of year. I mean, you know, I, I, it means our family comes back together, and we don't, in my home, I don't have, uh, we don't have a ton of dysfunction. <laughs> we try to put the fun in dysfunction in my house. No, um, we have, we, 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 I think we have a fairly healthy home. Now, I think when my kids grow up, they're going to realize there's more dysfunction in the home than they thought growing up. Like all of us have, there's function, there's, there's dysfunction. But there's others that Christmas is a, uh, a difficult time of the year for them. It's, it's a, a season that highlights or spotlights their loneliness or their isolation or perhaps grieving or pain. I, I just talked with someone um, this week who lost their wife this year after 56 years of marriage or, or 57 years of marriage. And so there's pain. There's all sorts of different circumstances. Uh, uh, but today I hope to reframe Christmas a little bit around an incredible idea. As, as I pre we prepare for this series, we, we've looked at Matthew chapter 1. I want to read that again. Um, but there's a phrase I'm going to highlight tonight uh, that, that I think is one of the, the most incredible thoughts about Christmas. See, here's what I think. 
Most of us, we, we believe Christmas is about Jesus, right? Now it is for us. But how many want to know? Christmas is not about Jesus for Jesus. Christmas was about us to him. We think it's about Jesus and Jesus thinks it's about us. And, and so and I want to look at this story. I want to reframe this thought today. I want to talk about, I, I want to talk about what it really, well, let's just, well, let's go through the scripture here. In Matthew chapter one, we'll pick up the story. The New Living Translation says, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. God was born. This is his nativity. Nativity literally means natal. It's, it's where the, the birthing place of something happens. And so this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But, say but. <laughs> That's the problem right there. Whenever there's a, 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 you know, a but, there's a conjunction, junction, what's your function? It means the story's gonna change here right now. But, uh, uh, before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then it says, Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man, he did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. I love this statement because he, Joseph was a man of character. He was a man who wanted to do right by his girlfriend who's now pregnant, and he doesn't want to embarrass her. But in those days when you're engaged and someone got you, you had grounds literally for a divorce. Legally, you could divorce someone. And so here's a, here's a man who has not had intimate relationships with Mary. She's found to be with child. So he's going he's gonna to be honorable to her. But how many want to know uh, uh, that there's sometimes a cost to follow Jesus? And Jesus might ask you to do something you don't want to do. And you might have decisions to go one way, but God goes, no, I got other plans for you. You know, and it says, as he considered this, in other words, as he considered to break the engagement, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David. The angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And last week, we talked about the incarnation, which was God becoming flesh, that, that, that God wrapped himself with skin and bones and came down on, on planet Earth, and, 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 uh, and, and, and he's 100% God and 100% man. The Holy Spirit uh, uh, is, the, is, you know, that literally, she, she's a virgin, the, the child within her was from God, but yet birth through her, so 100% man, 100% God. And it goes on, this is this, after this dream, it says, and she will, this is the angel saying, and she will have a son, and you're to name him, what? Jesus. Jesus. Now, this is a phrase I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of park on tonight, it says this, or today, for he will save his people from their sins. We think Christmas is about Jesus. Jesus thinks Christmas is about us and our sins being saved. The biggest gift of, of life is Jesus. And all of this occurred to fulfill the, the Lord's message through the prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child and she'll give birth to a son and they'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. I want to talk about this today. I want to reframe Christmas because, again, uh, 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 for some of us, Christmas is an incredible time, but others of us, Christmas is a difficult time, but I want you to reframe it, and I want, I want to zero in on that thought, uh, the, 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 the phrase here, that, that, uh, that literally, that, that he will save his people from their sins. Now, the angel shows up and is telling Joseph two things, and I think these are key things for us to understand, is the angel has given Joseph a quick theology lesson. Again, this Christmas truce, which we're talking about truth that is truth for all time, for all people, no matter what we feel about it. We're talking about objective truth, constant truth, universal truth. This is good today, tomorrow. It's good yesterday. It's never going to go out of style. It's good in any culture, any race, any tribe, any tongue, for all times. It's, 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 it's objective truth. Two truths that the angel's telling Jesus. Number one, or telling Joseph, Jesus came to save people from their sins. How many want to know that's truth? Yeah, right. He came to save people from their sins. How many have ever sinned? Some of you need to raise your hands all the way up. <laughs> Some of you, your, your friends are looking at you like, you need to raise your hand a little higher, buddy. You know, 
Uh, some of you, you know, when the ap- baptism application's filled out, we ask for references. The references say, hold them down a long time. They really need help. No. Um, but we, we, you know, Jesus came to save people from their sins. That's the first thing he's saying. Jesus, you name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Not his sins, their sins. And then number two, he's saying, we are the sinners in need of a savior. How many want to know we're sinners? There comes a time where we have to realize who we are and, and, and understand our life. And, and, and I, I was thinking about this. Um, have you ever asked yourself the question? If Jesus came to save people from their sins and we're sinners in need of saving, why? Have you ever asked yourself the question, what does sin really do to us? What does sin really do to people? Have you ever stopped to ask that question? Why would Jesus have to come to save us from sins? What what does sin really do? And I I, I was thinking through that. You just just start in in the Garden of Eden. When God tells Adam, you can eat from every tree in the garden, but the day you eat from this one tree, you'll surely die. And they eat from that tree, and they don't die. But now they see they're naked, and so they had to kill something to cover their, they cover themselves. They, uh, excuse me, they had to grab fig leaves and cover themselves. And, and, and when, the, when God came down to have fellowship with them like he normally did, they're hiding. He says, where are you? How many want to know? That's the number one question in the Bible is, where are you? At that time, I'll tell you where they were. They were hiding because of their sin. And they were in need of a Savior. And back in the Garden of Eden, what did God do? God killed an animal and shed blood so he could cover their nakedness and the shame from their sin. Because that's still the way God covers our sin and our, and our, and our, and, 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 and our shame is through the death and blood. And then if you track, you go through the Bible, there's sacrifices, all these things. But then Ezekiel says this. Ezekiel says, the soul that sins, it will die. And then Paul picks up this idea and says this. That Paul picks up the idea and says, the soul, he, he says the wages of sin is death. death, but, oh, conjunction, junction, what's your function again? But the gift of God is what? Eternal life. Eternal life. What does sin really do to people? Sin kills. That's why later in Romans, and I think I talked about this a week or so ago. Paul says that, 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 that when Adam sinned, death, sin, sin, sin came to all people and death came with it. Sin does not come by itself. It brings something called death. The wages of sin is death. That's why John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him will not What does sin really do? Sin kills. I was was thinking, how how do you illustrate exactly what what, what God's love, for God so loved the world that he gave? Christmas, we were on his mind. And and, and the best way to describe it would be if, if two people were best friends in Fairbanks, Alaska, uh, or let's say North Pole, or uh, one, they're in Esther, North Pole. No, that's not fair. Um, they're, they're Fairbanks. And uh, they were best friends. They went to school together. Uh, they, they, they graduated top of their class in every sports together. They did everything together. They went to college together. They went to, you know, they studied biology at UAF, and then they realized they want to go on uh, to become doctors, so they left to go lower 48. Got, they, they both got admitted to medical school at the same time. One of them became a cardiologist. The other one became a family practitioner, and they both moved back to Fairbanks because that was their dream. Fairbanks is the best place to live. They learn in the four years, five years, they're in lower 48. Why would we want to live down there when we can live in Fairbanks? The coolest place on planet Earth. So they move back to Fairbanks, Alaska, and, 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 and the family practitioner sets up his practice, and, and every year he, he, he told his cardiologist, hey, to keep your insurance credentials, you have to have a physical. I'll do your physical for free if you check my heart for free. I said, perfect. We're friends. And one year, the cardiologist goes in to get his heart checked and get everything checked. And, and, and this one year, the doctor, his, his friend, uh, realizes there's some challenges. I mean, they were so good, they dated the same girl at different times. <laughs> they got married to different girls. But they were best men in each other's weddings. They went on vacation together. They were just good friends. And 
This one year, the doctor, the family practitioner realized his friend had some challenge, some, some long, so he had something going on, so he drew some blood, and he called him back and says, we need to do a little bit more blood work, does the blood work, comes back, and, and he finds out with the blood work, his best friend, the cardiologist, has a rare form of cancer. And, and, and he realizes he's got to tell his best friend he's got cancer. It's not just a rare form of cancer. It's, it's it, it, from the study, they realize that more study, it's gone to every major organ in his body and he doesn't have long to live. So they, they, you know, he calls his buddy up and says, hey, they have an appointment, they get there, and, and his buddy's joking about the ball game they played the other day or whatever, the UAF hockey game, and, and, and his buddy, he's, just, he's, he's not very, uh, the, the family practitioner's not really, he's not exuding any enthusiasm, and, and his buddy goes, what's wrong, bro? He says, he says, I don't know how to tell you this. I wish I could tell you I was joking, and we've done a lot of pranks and joked a lot, he said, but your blood report came back and we had some, on, the oncologist took a look at it. He says, you have a rare form of cancer. It's gone to every major organ in your body and you don't have but six months to live if you're lucky. There's no cure. His friend looks at him, come on. He goes, listen, I'm not joking. And this cardiologist, the doctor, his face turns white and he's just sitting there because he realizes, man, what am I? I've got kids, they're young, I've got a family, I've got all this stuff. And, and, and his, the, the family practitioner sits down, puts his hand in his, his, his face in his hands, and he's sitting there, and, and, and at one moment, it's quiet, it's been a couple minutes of silence, and the, and the family practitioner says, I hate cancer. I hate it. I hate can Cancer doesn't, it's not affecting the family practitioner one bit. He doesn't have cancer. Cancer's not his problem. He's not affected by cancer. But why does he hate cancer? It's killing the one he loves so much. And for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever, God's love for us because he knows we have something called sin. Sin doesn't affect God. Jesus is not affected by sin. Jesus has never been tempted by sin. Jesus lives in a realm beyond sin. It's not his problem. Whose problem is it? It's our problem. And it's killing the ones he loves. But according to the angel, You'll name him Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. The very thing that brings death, he came to save. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's why at True North Church, we'll do anything short of sin to reach people far from Jesus because we believe Christmas is about Jesus, but he believed Christmas was about us. The incarnation was God becoming flesh so, so that he could, he could save us, he could redeem us. In fact, I, I want to look at another passage here in a second, but I want to frame it this way. I want to, I want to talk about three, three, th three truths regarding Jesus and our salvation. He came to save us of our sins. What does that really mean? We could call this, in, 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 in theology, they'd call this soteriology, the study of salvation, the study uh, of what does that mean to be saved? What does it truly mean that Jesus, what did Jesus really do? And to best, to, to best couch this or communicate it, there, there's another prophetic word that's spoken in, in, in later on in, in, in the Gospel of Luke from Zechariah. Zechariah was John the Baptist's father. And, 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 and it, so let me, let me take you back a little bit here. Before Jesus was born, Mary's uh, cousin, her name was Elizabeth, was married to Zechariah, and she was, she was infertile. She could not have a child. And, and all of a sudden, Zechariah, um, uh, uh, is, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a priest. He's called, uh, uh, he's a, he, the lot falls on him, and once in a lifetime, a priest will be allowed to go into the Holy of Holies and first offer sacrifices for himself and then for the people. And he'd go in the Holy of Holies. Well, while he's in the Holy of Holies, he has an angelic visitation, and God tells him, his wife who's not pregnant is going to have a child. And he goes, how could that be? Now I'm going to know what's impossible with man is possible with God. And because of his doubt, he can't talk until after the baby's born. But in, that, in, in his muteness, the Holy Spirit, God tells him, when, when the baby's born, you're to name him John. 
And so sure enough, he gets, he's the high priest, he leaves, he goes back to the home, his wife gets pregnant, and he can't talk, and for nine months, he can't say a word. And when the baby's born, they said, what should we name him? She says, and so she, he, Zachariah asks for a palette or a piece of, you know, a whiteboard to write, and he writes his name, John. And the moment they said, John, he, he starts talking. And then all of a sudden, he begins to prophesy. And he says this, he says this, uh, uh, he says in Luke chapter one, then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited, he's incarnated. Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He pitched his tent in our neighborhood. He visited and redeemed. Say redeemed. Now, in a moment, I'm going to show you what that word means, and we're all going to get some happy feet in here. You might actually shout. I mean, last, a week or two ago, when I looked up what that word redeem meant, I had to go around. I, I went to every staff member into every office. And, you got you to you hear this. It's incredible. So I'm going to share that with you in a moment. But I'll try to remain like Dan Bro, very calm. Redeemed in his people. He says he's redeemed his people and he has set us a mighty savior. Say savior. savior. From, the ro- from, from the royal line of his servant David. So if you're, if you're halfway savvy, you're thinking, oh, three truths regarding Jesus' salvation. Maybe one is he visited us. Maybe two, he redeemed us. And number three, maybe he came to save us. You're exactly right. So let's talk about that. Three truths about, uh, about salvation. Number one, Jesus visited his people. Now, that word visit here is a unique word. It's not like he just like bought an airplane ticket, showed up at your house and said, hey, how you doing? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm a word nerd. And so forgive me if some of you like, I, I just want it simple. I'm, I'm going to bring up a couple Greek words up. That the, old, the New Testament's written in Greek. The Old Testament's written in Hebrew. I want to talk about a couple Greek words. Because if you understand what they mean, you'll be like, whoa. God was, when, when God spoke through Zechariah with a prophetic word, the words he used were very specific words that sometimes you don't see if you just read it in the English language. The, the word sin means, uh, in, the, in the Greek language, the word sin literally means missing the mark. So I want you to know right now, if any of you go on vacation and you miss me, you're sinning. <laughs> I want you to know that. I got some friends in here. They're going to come to our life group party at our house this Sunday, and they're going to go to Mexico. And when they miss me, they're going to be sinning. Okay, missing the mark means to sin. But, but the word visit in the Hebrew, excuse me, in the Greek language, it's the, it, 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 praise the Lord, the God, because he's visited and redeemed his people. But, but the Greek word is episcopus. Say scopus. Episcopus means to look after, to inspect, to examine in order to visit. But, but guess what? The word scopus, it's where we get the word scope. Anyone like scopes? Now, I'm 50 years old, and my wife's been telling me for a while, I need to get scoped, but we won't go there. It's that time of year, she says, in my life. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if you're 50 years old, you know what that means. But the word scopus, literally, the Greek, the Greek, the, the Greek word scopus is not on here. It means to, to observe, to, to, to be a watchman, to... to, to the, the distant mark is looked at. In other words, uh, sco- literally, he came to scope us out, to hunt, to find. He came to seek and scope the lost. He put a mark on us. And if sin is missing the mark, he came to mark us so we'd never have to be full of sin anymore. He literally, in, 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 you know, in the Bible, it tells a story. You see, it's interesting that the word means, the, the, the sin means missing the mark, but Christmas means he marked us so we wouldn't miss out on him. That's what Christmas means. He came and visited us. He came. That's why the Bible says his eyes run to and throw throughout the earth looking. What about the story of the one person, the, the, the shepherd that lost 99 sheep and left the 99 behind to scope out the one? Well, the woman had 10 coins and she lost one and she tore the house out, scoping out to mark and find the one that was lost. Jesus, when he visited, he came to target us. How many want to know we are the target of his love? We are the target of his entire. When he stood on the cross at the end, or when he was on the cross at the end, he said, it is finished. What was finished? He came. We were his target of his love and he gave himself so we wouldn't have to perish, but we could have everlasting life. He visited us. Christmas is about him scoping us out. Not in a creepy way. 
in a good way. It's why the Bible says he chose us before we chose. He scoped us out before we ever scoped him out. He visited us. Came to the, the, the second truth. I, I got to go on here. The second truth is Jesus redeemed his people. And this is where I, 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 I'm a nerd. I like words. But I've, I, I've rarely seen this in the original language. And I, I like the original language. I'm one of those people that <laughs> sometimes my funnest devotional times is reading uh, some, some little Greek or whatever. And, and I'm, I'm studying this. And, and if you ever have, a, if there's an app called the Blue Letter Bible app you can download and, and, and it's, a, it's an incredible way just to kind of read the, the, the Bible and then click on a verse and look at, the, look, look at what it says in the Greek and, and, and the different words. Um, but the word redeemed, what's interesting, it's two words. Not compound words, two completely different words. And there's different words in the New Testament for redeem, but the one Zechariah used, he couldn't say one word, he said two words, but the English interpreters put the word redeem, but it literally means this, and I want to walk through both, because this is where you're going to get happy feet. You might actually get gospel goose pimples. <laughs> Ecclesiastical nudads might go up and down your spine like, whoa, that's good. That's what happened, okay? The first word for redeem. The first word, he says, so, so literally, the Greek is poieo. Say poieo. I mean, if, if, if we wanted to make it like Simone, we could just add about 20 more vowels, okay? But poieo means to make, to prepare, to author, to ordain, or to cause. The, the, the Hebrew equivalent would be he's to speak into existence. It's the Greek equivalent to God, the creator, the author, the, 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 the causer of all things. How many want to know if something happens, there's a cause? He's the cause. If there's a cause, there's an ultimate causer. His name is God. But part of the word redeem is to author, create, rewrite. That's one half of the word, but the other word, the other word is the one we kind of know. It means to, to ransom, redeem, to pay the penalty for sin. How many want to know the wages of sin is death? Someone has to pay the penalty for our sin. But the word redeem from Zechariah's perspective is someone came to visit us. But not just to visit us, but someone came to pay for the penalty of sin so a brand new story could be written with our life. Follow me here. That's why... A drug addict doesn't have to stay a drug addict because God can forgive them for the penalty of sin and write a brand new story in their life. That's why you can walk through divorce, Karen, and yes, you walk through hell and back in a, in a marriage that, that failed and you feel maybe like, oh, oh man, but God can flip the script on that thing and rewrite a brand new story. That's why in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians it says, the old is gone, but the new has come. Do you understand? Zechariah said, praise the Lord. He has visited us, but he hasn't just visited us and scoped us out. Oh, no, 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 no. He's going to redeem us, which means he'll pay for the sin. And on top of that, he's got a new story to write. I don't know about you. I don't know where you're at or how far you feel like you've gone. Or if you're in the auditorium or listening online right now. It doesn't matter if you're in, in, in a prison sentence right now and you're there for a while. God has a new story to write in your life. God can take you, redeem you, pay for the penalty, and then start writing a brand new story. Your best days are ahead. So he came to visit us. The incarnation. See, Christmas... We well, think it's about Jesus. He said, no, I want to pay for sin and write a new story. It's about people. It's about, about what I can do when my life intersects with people. Chris, he scoped us out because he knows. The world sees something broken, they throw it away. God sees something broken, he goes, oh, I, can, I, got, I got ideas for that. I got plans, I got a hope, and I've got a future. I can put broken pieces back together. That's what I do. That's what I do. That's God. The third thing, the, 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 the truth about regarding Jesus and our salvation is he visited us, he redeemed us. How many of you guys are excited that he redeemed us? Yeah. And number three, Jesus was sent as a mighty savior. 
Now, I, I want to be careful. Well, let's read this verse here. It says, praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Could you imagine Zechariah hasn't talked for nine months? And one of his first words is, I've got to praise the God of Israel because he's visited, he's redeemed his people, he's sent us a mighty, 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 an all-powerful savior from the royal line of his servant David. It, it goes almost back to Isaiah where it says, for unto us a child is born, he's visited us, a son is given, he, he, he's incarnated, and he's, he's, a, he's a mighty God, a wonderful counselor, prince of peace, an everlasting father. And the governor of the world will be on his shoulders. But when I read this word Savior, I thought redeem was good. And it is good. But when I read the word Savior in the Greek, uh, it, it, it's the Greek word soteria, which is where we get soteriology, which is the study of salvation. But it literally means deliverance or preservation. And, and, and I didn't want to put the next word up there. I want to explain something. See, there's something about being saved from the penalty of our sin. But there's something different than when God says, I'm a mighty savior who can save you from the power of sin. There's a difference between the penalty of sin and the power of sin can be broken. And let me explain this. How many want to know God has great plans for us, plans for hope and a future, but there's someone called the devil who wants to rob, kill, and destroy when Jesus sits, you know, he's handled the scroll, and his first, you know, he, go, he, he, he's baptized, he goes in the wilderness for 40 days, he comes back, and he shows up at the, at the temple, uh, or, and, and they hand him a scroll, and, and, and he, 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 he gets, he reads it, he says, uh, uh, so, someone is anointed to preach the good news, to, 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 to heal the sick, to, 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 to give sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to, give, to, to, to set the prisoner free, and then he said, the lame will walk, and then he sits down and says, today, it's finished in your hearing. Sight for the blind is here. Healing for the sick is here. Freedom for the captive is here. Release for the oppressed, it's here, it's done. I'm the mighty savior. But that word, the other definition, I didn't put it up here because it's, it's one of those words in our, in our culture, it's a scary word. But I want to read it to you in the context of how many want to know God has plans for us, but the enemy wants to thwart the plans God has for us. And I was talking to chaplain this week. There was another suicide at the base, and I said, what's good? He says, Mark, I feel like there's a spiritual warfare going on, and the devil does not want people to understand all that God has for them. But the word, the word might, the soteria, it's deliverance and pre preservation. But, but literally, it means this. Literally, in the Greek language, it means rescuing. Follow me here. This is a scary word, but it's a word that's, if you understand the power, picture of it. He came to be a mighty savior to rescue us from, and in the Greek language, the word that, 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 that's written in the Greek, the molestation from the enemy. And we hear that word and we go, that's the, that's the most heinous thing someone could do to someone else, to assault them, overstep boundaries. We have troopers in here, police officers in here, people listening. And we know assault is something you get arrested for and, and whatever. But how many want to know Jesus came to rescue us from the assault of the devil who wants to rob, kill, and destroy? He wants to take the assault and the... And I know that word is a bad... It's one of those words in our culture. But Jesus came to redeem us, write a new story, and keep us from the molestation of the devil. That's the picture of salvation. I don't know about you. I get excited when I think about it. He picked us. He saw our brokenness. He saw our hurt. He's not here to overstep his boundaries and take advantage of us. He came to kick the, 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 the he, he came to tell the devil, go to hell. Get your fingerprints off my people. I came to save people from their sins. The power of sin, the penalty of sin. He came to write a brand new story. I think about Jacqueline. There was an altar call one day, and I'm, I'm, I'm administered this church, and this girl comes up, and I never didn't know her before this night. And as I'm praying with her, the Holy Spirit says, tell her to put a white dress on and dance for me. I'm thinking, like, that's weird. So I said, what's your name? She said, my name's Jacqueline. I said, Jacqueline. I, I, it might have been the jalapenos on my pizza last night, but I feel like the Holy Spirit told me to say something, and it could be God, or it could have been the jalapenos. But God told me to put a white dress on, tell you to put a white dress on the dance floor. She started crying. 
I thought, oh, great. Estrogen. So I went to go pray for guys, and I said, honey, come over here, and I had my wife go pray for this girl, and then my wife about 10 minutes later said, come here, and she says, Jacqueline has a story to tell you, and she tells me, Jacqueline, and Jacqueline told me, Mark, the last time I wore a white dress, I was a senior in high school. I was getting ready for my senior prom. I'd been dating my boyfriend for, for three years. We'd been pure. We'd not been intimate. And, and I, I went to church. He went to church. We made great decisions. But he broke up with me the night I was supposed to go to prom. I had my white dress on. My makeup was ready. My parents went out for an engagement that they had. And I was at the house. I got a call about a half hour later that he wasn't going to pick me up. He's going to prom somewhere else. She said, I was so angry, so mad. I, I went out that, la- that night. I lost my virginity. And this was in Vegas. I slept with more people. People. I made more poor decisions, and, and I never thought I could come back to church because I felt like I'd be judged, and I would be, I, I would be rebuked, and no one could love me, and the, the worst thing in my mind was I knew I couldn't wear a white dress on my wedding day again, but you walked up out of all the things you could say to me. You told me to put my white dress on, that God wanted me to put a white dress on and dance for him, and at that moment, I felt forgiveness flood me like I've never felt before. The enemy had been telling her for years she couldn't get pure again. The enemy had told her for years she'll never be forgiven. She'd gone too far. Gone. She'd done too much. But let me tell you right now, the enemy will torment you, assault you in your mind, tell you that you're not worth anything, that you'll always be an addict, you'll never have freedom, you're always going to be stuck, you'll never get it, your, your, your marriage will never be functional again. He'll tell, he'll lie to you all he can to assault you from the destiny God has for us. A destiny that says you're loved. For God so loved the world that Christmas happened. He told Joseph, you're going to be a stepdad to someone that will save the world from their sins. You're going to adopt this son. scope us out. I don't know where you're at right now, but I can tell you right now, he's already scoped you out. He knows right where you're at. And he wants to redeem you. He wants to purchase your ransom from hell. And he wants to rewrite a new story with your life. And if by chance you're here today or you're listening online and you're far from God, I've got good news for you. There is a mighty Savior who wants to redeem you, purchase you, write a brand new story, and he wants to give you hope. That's why, that's why we read in Corinthians that that he died for all, say all. He died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Christmas happened so Easter could happen, and Easter happened so you could happen. Because it goes on in verse 17, it says, there, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. If you're here today and you're listening and, and you're tired of the old and you're tired of where you're at and you've never given God a chance, you don't try God like broccoli. You give him, you, you commit to it. And the old can be gone and the new can come. There's a spiritual transaction. And I'll tell you right now, through that transaction, there's a mighty Savior who will stand up and say, "Uh, uh, uh, no, 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 no. Get away from him. Get away from her. He stands before the accuser of the brethren, the one that wants to overstep boundaries and assault your mind and assault your thoughts and assault your relationships and tear you down. There's a mighty Savior who wants to deliver you and set you free. If you're here today listening or online and you've never made a commitment to Jesus, we say it to North this way. It's as easy as A, B, C, A. Admit you sinned. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. B, believe that Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of our sins. And C, confess our sins. Confess him as the Lord of our life and he will redeem us and he'll save us. If you're here today and you want that or you're listening online and you've never prayed that prayer, would you bow your heads and close your eyes wherever you're at and pray this prayer silence that prayer out loud. Dear Jesus, today I admit I've sinned and I believe Jesus died on the cross to forgive me of my sins. Please forgive me today. Please be my savior and my life leader. I confess you as the Lord of my life. Please forgive me from the thing you hate the most, sin, and the death that comes with it. 
give me the life that only you can bring. In Jesus' name, amen. What a fantastic service. If something in today's message moved your heart and you would like to pray with someone, you can text ABC to the number at the bottom of your screen and someone will reach out to you soon. And be sure to stay in touch by following us on social media so you can stay up to date with all that is happening at True North.